At, as Minister of Youth and Young Adults, I am a voting delegate at our conference assemblies. And whenever I go to these assemblies, uh, there's one in the spring and one in the fall, I'm absolutely drained by the end of the day. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoy going there and connecting with other leaders. But it's the kind of event that doesn't come naturally to me. So two years ago at our spring assembly, the topic was God's power at work. To be quite honest, I really enjoyed this assembly as we heard the stories of how God was at work in other churches in our conference. But at one point we reconvened and read through Ephesians 3 verses 14 through 21, which is entitled, A Prayer for the Ephesians. Paul prays for the power of the Holy Spirit for them, that Christ may dwell in their hearts. And then he has this famous benediction of how he hopes they grasp how long and high and deep is the love of God. I forget the exact question that was asked after this reading, but it was something along the lines of, what sticks out to you today from the scripture as you're here at assembly? Now before I give you my answer, let me paint a picture. Here I am, an introvert, who's easily intimidated, at a table of pastors and credentialed leaders that I barely even know. And for all you extroverts out there, um, these are the kind of situations that are not really ideal for an introvert. Well, at least for this introvert who absolutely needs to mull things over before anything comes out of my mouth. And here I am at this table, fairly new to Atlantic Coast Conference, and not really sure about what goes on at conference meetings. And I need to answer a question about how I feel to almost complete strangers. So I decide to take a stab at it, since usually I'm the one that is last to speak in a group. And I thought I would throw caution to the wind. And I almost completely forget my answer, but I know that the word family was involved. And I think it was verses 14 through 15 that stuck out to me where it says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I remember saying something about how coming to conference stuff almost feels like a family gathering because you're gathering with other believers in God. Little to my knowledge, my entire table could have not have felt more opposite about that statement. <laughs> no one disrespected me at all, but inside I wanted to go crawl in a corner. But I wish I would have stood my ground. That's my least favorite trait about me. I backed down too easily, only to think of a million other things I would have said in that situation. But I really wish I would have stood my ground because others went on to say that in family, they experience hurt and pain and awkwardness. And now looking back on it, I think that that's all a part of the family experience. Families are capable of hurt, not listening, not communicating, and many other way complicated things. Unless we are talking about a really bad or abusive situation, families are people you just need to navigate life with because you cannot always run away from or ignore the people or the stuff in our lives. Families are also people who, can, who we can sometimes just kind of get used to as we live with them and go through life with them. You don't realize how much fun they are or how many good memories you had with them until you don't live with them anymore. As we look at our text today, we will talk about loving our family and we can think of family as either biological or spiritual. The love in this passage is more than just like a touchy-feely feeling. It's love in action. But it's sometimes tough to love in biological families and in larger church families where humans, emotions, opinions, and sin are involved. Loving our family is not fun and happy all the time, but it's biblical and requires sacrifice. Now let me make a disclaimer before questions fly through your mind or you throw me out of here. Um, I realize that this could be a touchy subject, and I want you to know that I'm, I'm not here at all to disrespect 
any of my family or any family in this place. I dearly love my married family as well as my own family. So to give you a bit of background on the scripture, it is argued but generally agreed upon that the author of this book was the Apostle John. This letter is not a typical letter form with a formal opening and closing like 2nd and 3rd John. A scholar by the name of Robert Kaisar actually believes that 1st John is snippets of sermons that are pieced together to make up this book. In this particular church that John is writing to, there has been schisms, questions about the truth of Jesus, and influence of Gnosticism. If you don't know, the Gnostic way of thinking was central around this idea that spirit is good, spirit is entirely good, and matter is entirely evil. So because our body is matter, it's evil. And salvation is escape from this body. In this particular church, the believers are being influenced by this way of thinking, which has in turn led them to not living godly lives. Because if, according to Gnostic thinking, salvation comes from leaving this body, then why would we need to live ethical, moral, and godly lives here on earth? John spends his time in his, this letter trying to emphasize that how you live on earth really matters and how you treat other people really matters. And that loving as Christ loved us is essential in being a Christian. And he uses a lot of contrasts in this book, like light and darkness and love and hate, to get his point across. So the contrast that is presented in this passage is love and hate. So let's take a look at verses 11 through 12. This is the passage you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the devil and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So here is John reminding them of the simple command that they've heard before to love one another. And then here is the stark Old Testament contrast of the story of Cain. And as I was preparing, I had to go back and reread the story of Cain and Abel. So let's just revisit that. And if you'll turn with me to Genesis 4, verses 1 through 10, we'll revisit the story. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now the verse that stuck out to me was verse 7. I, ever, I, I never really thought about this verse, or it was one of those that I kind of brushed over while reading. But it says, uh, or God says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And this is the first thing I want to pull from our text today. Sin is always crouching at our door. 
That sin that crouches at our door wants to keep us from loving the family of God. John right away proclaims that God's children do what is right and the devil's children do not love their brothers and sisters. Cain may be an extreme example, but it goes to show how easily we could become a child of the devil. He knew what was right and could have easily done it. But instead, in a single decision, he became a child of the devil. I really struggled to put this point into the sermon today because I can't completely fathom in my mind turning my back wholeheartedly against a family member. Yet Cain, who grew up with Abel, played outside with him and laughed with him, was so overtaken with evil thoughts for him that he murdered him. But maybe that's the point. When we don't love our own family, whether biological or spiritual, we are completely missing the point of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And Satan loves it when we miss the point. Maybe we don't literally commit murder, but what if we have completely cut off ties with our family? I am convinced that God gave us biological families to reflect the family of God, with God as the head. What if when we cut out our brothers and sisters from our lives, we are also cutting out God? And this leads me to my next point. How we, should, how we act should reflect our inward transition from death to life. Verses 14 and 15 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Love for our brothers, again, biological or spiritual, is a byproduct of accepting Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. For some, this seemingly simple byproduct is more challenging than it is for others, depending on what you've been through in life. Sometimes loving our brothers and sisters can be a steep request, but it's biblical. One way to think about our actions towards our brothers and sisters is to ask yourself, are my actions towards this person life-giving or life-taking? I think when you look at your actions in that light, it makes things pretty clear about how we should or shouldn't be acting towards our brothers and sisters. I received a t-shirt from a junior high lock-in that I didn't actually even attend, but I still like it. Um, so this is a shirt, and on the front, uh, it has a person standing here, and it says, yeah, I'm a bucket head. And then on the back of the shirt, it has a whole saying, and this is what the saying said. God cares about how I treat people. By treating people the way I want to be treated, I'm filling their buckets. If I ain't treating folks right, I'm nothing but a bucket dipper. I'm making a difference by filling buckets. It's an easy way to think about how we treat others. Are we filling up others' buckets, or are we taking away from others' buckets? I admit I've still got a long ways to go in loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I don't think that loving others is something that comes naturally or by our own strength. We need God to intervene in our lives to help us love. I do want to mention that we are not always going to feel like being loving towards our brothers and sisters. After reading about Cain, you may be praying, may I never have a negative thought or action against a brother or sister so that I don't do anything crazy. But God knows our hearts, which is good, because I know I've not always have had loving thoughts and actions towards my brothers. For example, I grew up in a time where we only had one computer in a household where four people shared it. And when I was bugging my brother too much about getting on the computer, he would take revenge on me and <laughs> take a lighter out and start burning his leg hairs. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever had smelled burning hair, but it smells terrible. <laughs> so um, that made me mad. <laughs> so I did not always think nice things about my brother. But unfortunately, it worked when he did that. <laughs> but the fact is, we're human. 
We have emotions, we have needs and limits. We aren't always going to act or think lovingly. Verse 21 says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Let Cain be our extreme example of what not to do. As long as our hearts continue to be right with God and we are thankful and aware of the sacrifice Jesus accomplished for us, we can have confidence before God. But our love for others should be what sets us apart as Christians, like the song, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. If we cannot love our brothers and sisters, those who are closest to us, how are we going to fully love those who are not Christians? If those who are not Christians see us acting in unloving ways towards our family, they're going to see straight through our shallow love for them. The third thing I want to pull from this passage is this practical application of what love is. Love is laying down our lives as Jesus did. Laying down our lives may not always be physically giving up our lives for another. Well, that could be likely. But laying down our lives looks like what we find in verses 16 through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Maybe laying down your life looks like setting aside your needs and wants so that your brothers and sisters can instead be fulfilled. In the April 12 Adult Sunday School lesson, it writes for this passage, if there's ever going to be love practice in the community, members have to change. We cannot stay stuck in our own ways if families are gonna stick together. Two weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to the Mennonite Church USA Youth Ministry Council. And while we were there, we had a speaker present on Latino history and the history of racism of the Latino community in the US. Basically, our speaker was trying to broaden our horizons of and expand this concept of racism beyond only black and white. So we discussed a lot about how we grew up, what prejudices were instilled in us as we grew up, white privilege, and other really weighty topics. And our focus text of the week came out of Luke 10, verses 25 through 37, which is the parable of the Good Samaritan, where a man falls into the hands of robbers and they left him along the road, and this priest and a Levite walk by, completely avoiding this man. But a lowly Samaritan cares deeply enough for this man and he helps him. As we thought about this text in light of racism, I thought this Samaritan went way out of his way to help this guy who was a complete stranger. This man went the extra mile for this stranger laying on the road to die. How often do I find myself giving up my precious time to help out a brother or a sister in Christ? Or for that matter, my biological brothers. I think that verse 17 is encouraging us not to be like the priest or the Levite, who can see this man as clearly in need, but they just cross to the other side of the road and walk on by. Too often I'm way too guilty of that. I see a need and just think to myself, someone else is way more capable to handle that situation. But we've got to stop thinking like that. We cannot always be focused on ourselves. We need to observe the needs of the family. But truthfully, with biological families or the family of God, sometimes it's harder to see the needs since we really like to hide our problems and make it seem like our lives are just fine and dandy. In a second, and I hope this works out, I'm going to count to three. And I want you to raise your hand if you have something going on in your life that you struggle with. Whether that be a decision, a workplace conundrum, a family crisis, depression, faith questions, struggles to be a morning person, it can be anything, big or small. 
So do you have something that you struggle with? On the count of three. One, two, three. All right, it worked out. <laughs> so we all have struggles, and, and we all want to meet each other's needs. And if you saw everyone raise your hand, raise their hand, there's needs in this very room. Um, and this whole mission field just suddenly opened up. It's not fun to admit sometimes that we have struggles, but it's real reality. So my encouragement is get to know one another and ask how you can help one another. We need to love our brothers and sisters, go the extra mile, and encourage one another in our actions. How are you going to, like it says on the sign back there, enter the mission field? When there's no loving actions going on in the family. And this brings me to my last point. I am so, so, so glad I'm a part of this family of God. I'm thankful for my biological family who raised me to be who I am. But I'm also thankful to be here in this church. There's so much rich wisdom, community, and loving kindness that happens here. And you all do so well at loving families. And my encouragement and hope as we continue to journey together as part of the larger body of Christ is that we communicate and learn from each other's stories. Keep loving one another and looking to help with the needs of the family members. Because when family members are taken care of, then they can go out into the mission field and care for others. I also want to mention that if you do not have biological family to learn how to love deeper, I encourage you to find a church family to love. And if you need prayer for learning how to love family members, um, I've asked Andy and Dot to be up here um, filling in for 